Hi everyone, this is Doc Ina. Welcome to my lecture on cesarean delivery. To download my lecture deck in PDF form, please go to my WordPress site, Doc Ina Obigaine. Reference for this lecture is Williams Obstetrics 25th edition, Chapter 30, Cesarean Delivery. And this is the outline of my lecture. So what is cesarean delivery? Cesarean delivery is the delivery of a fetus via laparotomy or what you call an abdominal incision and then followed by a hysterotomy or a uterine incision. There are two general types of cesarean delivery. First is primary, which refers to a first-time hysterotomy, and a second is secondary, which denotes a uterus with one or more prior hysterotomy incisions. There are several indications for cesarean delivery. There are maternal, maternal-fetal, and fetal indications. So for the maternal indications, we have a prior cesarean delivery, especially if the prior uterine incision was a uh, classical in type of incision, an abdominal placentation, for example, a placenta previa, maternal request, a known uterine scar type, uterine incision dehiscence, prior full thickness myomectomy, genital tract obstructive mass, invasive cervical cancer, prior trachelectomy, permanent cerclage, prior pelvic reconstructive surgery, pelvic deformity, HSV or herpes simplex virus or HIV infection, cardiac or pulmonary disease, cerebral aneurysm or AV mal, pathology requiring concurrent intra-abdominal surgery, and a perimortem cesarean delivery. Maternal-fetal indications include cephalopelvic disproportion or dystocia, failed operative vaginal delivery, for example, if you attempted to do a forceps extraction but failed, a placenta previa or placental abruption. Fetal indications include the following, a non-reassuring fetal status, malpresentation, macrosomia, congenital anomaly, abnormal umbilical cord Doppler studies, thrombocytopenia, and a prior neonatal birth trauma. So what are the techniques for cesarean delivery? In obstetrics, usually a midline vertical or a suprapubic transverse incision is chosen for laparotomy or for the abdominal incision. Transverse abdominal entry is by either fan and steel or maillard incisions. Of these, the fan and steel incision is selected most frequently for cesarean delivery. Transverse incisions follow Langer lines of skin tension, and superior cosmetic results compared with vertical incisions can be achieved. Additionally, decreased rates of post-op pain, fascial wound dehiscence, and incisional hernia compared with vertical entry are the benefits of this type of incision. The use of the fan and still incision, however, is often discouraged for cases in which a large operating space is important or in which access to the upper abdomen may be needed. Because of the layers created during incision of the internal and external oblique aponeurosis with transverse incisions, purulent fluid can collect between this. And therefore, cases with high infection risks may favor a midline incision. And lastly, neurovascular structures which include the ilioinguinal and iliohypogastric nerves in superficial and inferior epigastric vessels are often encountered with uh, transverse incisions. Logically, bleeding, wound hematoma, and neurological disruption may more frequently complicate this transverse incisions compared with vertical incision. Now, with repeat cesarean delivery, re-entry through a fan and still incision usually is more time-consuming and difficult because of the scarring. The Maillard incision, on the other hand, differs mainly from fan and still in that the bellies of the rectus abdominis muscles are transected horizontally to widen the operating space. It is technically more difficult due to its required isolation and ligation of the inferior epigastric arteries, which lie lateral to these muscle bellies. Vertical infraumbilical incisions or vertical incisions that are below the umbilicus provide quick entry to shorten incision to delivery time. Moreover, this vertical incision has minimal blood loss, superior access to the upper abdomen, generous operating room, and the flexibility for easy wound extension if greater space or access is needed. No important neurovascular structures traverse this incision and aponeurosis at the linea alba are fused. Main disadvantages are poor cosmetic results, of course, higher fascial dehiscence or incisional hernia rates, and greater post-op pain. For morbidly obese patients, a vertical incision that extends up and around the umbilicus may be preferable to avoid cutting through a large panus. 
For the fan and still incision or what you also call the bikini cut, the skin and the subcutaneous tissue are incised using a low transfer, slightly curvilinear incision. And this is made at the level of the pubic hairline, which is typically 3 cm above the superior border of the symphysis pubis. The incision is extended beyond the lateral borders of the rectus abdominis muscles. And this should be of adequate width to accommodate the delivery of the fetus, typically 12 to 15 cm in length. Sharp dissection is continued through the subcutaneous layer to the fascia and superficial epigastric vessels can be identified halfway between the skin and the fascia, several centimeters from the midline, and this should be coagulated. The fascia is then incised sharply at the midline. The anterior abdominal fascia is typically composed of two visible layers, the aponeurosis from the external oblique muscle and the fused layer containing the aponeurosis of the internal oblique and the transverse abdominis muscles. The inferior epigastric vessels typically lie outside the lateral border of the rectus abdominis muscles and beneath the fused aponeurosis of the internal oblique and transverse abdominis muscles. Once the fascia is incised, the inferior fascial edge is grasped with suitable clamps and elevated by the assistant as the operator separates the fascial sheath from the underlying rectus muscles, either bluntly or sharply, until the superior border of symphysis pubis is reached. The superior fascial edge is grasped and again, separation of the fascia from the rectus muscles is completed. The fascial separation is carried near enough to the umbilicus to permit an adequate midline longitudinal incision of the peritoneum. The rectus abdominis and pyramidalis muscles are then separated in the midline by sharp and blunt dissection to expose the transversalis fascia and the peritoneum. The transversalis fascia and preperitoneal fat are dissected carefully to reach the underlying peritoneum. Peritoneum near the upper end of the incision is opened carefully. For the vertical abdominal incision, an infraumbilical midline vertical incision begins 2 to 3 cm above the superior margin of the symphysis up to the infraumbilical area, and this should be of sufficient length to allow the fetal delivery without difficulty. Incision length should correspond with the estimated fetal size, approximately 12 to 15 cm. Sharp or electrosurgical dissection is performed to the level of the anterior rectus sheath. A small opening is made sharply with scalpel in the upper half of the linea alba to avoid bladder injury. Index and middle, middle fingers are placed beneath the fascia and the fascial incision is extended superiorly and inferiorly with scissors or scalpel. Midline separation of the rectus muscles and pyramidalis muscles and peritoneal entry are then similar to those with the fan and still incision. So, let's talk about the Joel Cohen and Ms. Gabla DAP techniques. The Joel Cohen technique creates a straight 10 cm transfer skin incision 3 cm below the level of the anterior superior iliac spines. The subcutaneous tissue layer is opened sharply 2 to 3 cm in the midline and this is carried down without lateral extension to the fascia. A small transverse incision is made in the fascia and a finger from each hand is hooked into the lateral angles of this fascial incision. Then, the incision is then stretched transversely. All the layers of the abdominal wall are then manually stretched laterally in opposition to further open the incision. The myometrium is incised transversely in the midline and then opened and extended laterally with one finger hooked into each corner of the hysterotomy incision. Interrupted sutures are used for hysterotomy closure. Neither visceral nor parietal peritoneum is closed. On the other hand, the Ms. Gavladak technique is similar and differs mainly in that the myometrial incision closure is completed with a single layer locking continuous suture. These techniques have been associated with shorter operative times and with lower rates of intraoperative blood loss and post-op pain. Now we go to the uterine incision or what we call hysterotomy. There are two techniques for this. We have the low transverse incision where the lower uterine segment is incised transversely as described by Kerr and this is preferred over the classical incision. The classical incision on the other hand is the vertical incision into the body of the uterus above the lower uterine segment and reaches the uterine fundus, similar to the low segment vertical incision as described by Kronig. So let's first talk about the low transverse cesarean incision. The reflection of the peritoneum above the upper margin of the bladder and overlying the anterior lower uterine segment, which we call the bladder flap, is grasped in the midline with forceps and incised transversely with scissors. 
Following the initial incision, scissors are inserted between the vesicouterine serosa and myometrium on the lower uterine segment. Then the scissors are pushed laterally from the midline on each side to further open the visceral peritoneum and expose the myometrium. The lower edge of the peritoneum is elevated and the bladder is generally or gently separated from the underlying myometrium with blunt or sharp dissection within this vesicouterine space. So the uterus can be incised by a variety of techniques. Each is initiated by using a scalpel to transversely incise the exposed lower uterine segment for 1 to 2 centimeters in the midline. And this must be done carefully to avoid fetal laceration or to avoid injuring the any fetal part. So once the uterus is opened, the incision can be extended by simply spreading the incision using lateral and slightly upward pressure applied with each index finger as uh, shown here in this picture. Alternatively, if the lower uterine segment is thick, then cutting laterally and then slightly upward with bandage scissors will extend the incision. Importantly, when scissors are used, the index and midline fingers of the non-dominant hand, as you can see in this uh, picture on the right, should be insinuated be beneath the myometrium and above the fetal parts to prevent fetal laceration. Comparing blunt and sharp extensions of the initial uterine incision, sharp extension is associated with an increased estimated blood loss, but post-op uh, hematocrit changes, need for transfusion, and infection rates are not different. The uterine incision should be made large enough to allow delivery of the head and the trunk of the fetus without either tearing or having to cut into the uterine vessels that course along the lateral uterine margins. If the placenta is encountered in the incision line, it must be either detached or incised. When the placenta is incised, fetal hemorrhage may be severe. Thus, delivery and cord clamping should be performed as soon as possible. At times, a low transverse hysterotomy is selected but provides inadequate room for delivery. In such instances, one corner of the hysterotomy incision is extended cephalad into the contractile portion of the myometrium and that's what we call the J incision. If this is completed bilaterally, you have the U incision. Lastly, some prefer to extend in the midline, and that is what we call the T-incision. So as expected, these have been linked with higher intra-op blood loss. And moreover, as this extend into the contractile portion of the uterus, a trial of labor and vaginal delivery are more likely contraindicated in future pregnancies. This is a J-incision. Doing this bilaterally will give you a U-incision. And this is the T incision. Okay, so in a cephalic presentation, a hand is slipped into the uterine cavity between the symphysis and the fetal head, and the head is elevated gently with the fingers and palm through the incision. Once the head enters the incision, delivery may be aided by modest transabdominal fundal pressure that can be done by either by the anesthesiologist or your assist. After a long labor with cephalopelvic disproportion, the fetal head may be tightly wedged in the birth canal and this situation can have disastrous results and there are three considerations for delivery. First is a push method may be used. With this push method, an upward pressure exerted by a hand in the vagina by an assistant will help to dislodge the head and allow its delivery above the symphysis. Relief of such head impaction increases the risk of hysterotomy, extension, and associated blood loss, as well as the fetal skull fracture. As an alternative, a pull method is used in which the fetal legs are grasped and delivered through the hysterotomy opening. The fetus is then delivered by traction as one would complete a breech extraction. And support for this latter approach comes only from small randomized trials and case series. Lastly, a low vertical hysterotomy incision, which will give you more room for the pull technique, may be selected. If a low transverse incision has already been made, then this can be extended to a J, a U, or a T incision for more room. Conversely, in women without labor, the fetal head may be unmolded and without a leading cephalic point. Now, the round head may be difficult to lift through the uterine incision in a relatively thick lower uterine segment that is atten unattenuated by labor. In such instances, either forceps or a vacuum device may be used to deliver the fetal head as shown in this picture. After the head delivery, 
a finger should be passed across the fetal neck to determine whether it is encircled by one or more umbilical cord loops. If an umbilical cord coil is felt, it should be slipped over the head. The head is rotated to an occiput transverse position which aligns the fetal bisacromial diameter vertically. The sides of the head are grasped with two hands and gentle downward traction is applied until the anterior shoulder enters the hysterotomy incision. Next, by upward movement, the posterior shoulder is delivered. During delivery, abrupt or powerful force is avoided or should be avoided to avert brachial plexus injury. Now, with steady outward traction, the rest of the body then readily follows. Gentle fundal pressure may aid this. After delivery of the fetus, an intravenous infusion containing 2 ampules or 20 units of oxytocin per liter of crystalloid is infused at 10 ml per minute. Once the uterus contracts satisfactorily, the rate can be reduced. Bolus doses of oxytocin should be avoided because of associated hypotension. An alternative approach to oxytocin is carbetocin. This is a longer-acting oxytocin derivative that provides suitable, albeit more expensive, hemorrhage prophylaxis. Second-tier agents are ergot alkaloids, which is contraindicated in hypertensive and asthmatic women, and misoprostol, which is considered illegal, an illegal drug locally or in the Philippines. Now for the placental delivery. So the uterine incision is first observed for any vigorously bleeding sites and they should be promptly clamped with pennington or ring forceps. The placenta is then delivered unless it has already done so spontaneously. Many surgeons prefer manual removal but spontaneous delivery as shown in this picture along with some cord traction may reduce the risk of operative blood loss and infection. Fundal massage may begin as soon as the fetus is delivered to hasten placental separation and delivery. Immediately after delivery and gross inspection of the placenta, the uterine cavity is suctioned and wiped out with a gauze sponge to remove avulsed membranes, vernix, and clots. Previously, double glove fingers or ring forceps placed the through the hysterotomy incision were used to dilate an ostensibly closed cervix, but this practice does not improve infection rates from potential hematometra and is not recommended anymore. Now we go to the uterine repair. After placental delivery, the uterus is lifted through the incision into the draped abdominal wall and the fundus is covered with a moistened laparotomy sponge. Any laparotomy sponges are removed and the paracolic gutters and cul-de-sac are suctioned off blood and amniotic fluid. Some surgeons irrigate the gutters and cul-de-sac, especially in the presence of infection or meconium. Routine irrigation in low-risk women, however, leads to greater intraopnosia. After sponge and instrument counts are found to be correct, the abdominal incision is closed in layers. As each layer is closed, bleeding sites are located, clamped, and ligated or coagulated with an electrosurgical blade. Now for the classical cesarean incision. This incision is usually avoided because it encompasses the active upper uterine segment and thus is prone to rupture with subsequent pregnancies. Indications for classical CS are the following. Difficulty in exposing or safely entering the lower uterine segment. Alayumayuma occupies the lower uterine segment. The cervix has been invaded by cancer an anteriorly implanted placenta previa, and a massive maternal obesity that precludes safe access to the lower uterine segment, transverse lie of a large fetus, when the fetus is very small, especially if breech, a classical incision may be preferable, and with multiple fetuses, a classical incision again may be needed to provide suitable room for extraction of fetuses that may be malpositioned or preterm. For the uterine incision and repair of a classical CS, a vertical uterine incision is initiated with a scalpel beginning as low as possible and preferably within the lower uterine segment. If adhesions, insufficient exposure, a tumor, or placenta per creta preclude development of a bladder flap, then the incision is made above the level of the bladder. Once the uterus is entered with a scalpel, the incision is extended cephalad with bandage scissors until it is long enough to permit delivery of the fetus. With scissor use, the fingers of the non-dominant hand are insinuated between the myometrium and fetus to prevent fetal laceration. As the incision is opened, numerous large vessels that bleed profusely are commonly encountered within the myometrium. The remainder of fetal and placental delivery mirrors that of the low transverse hysterotomy. 
For incision closure, one method employs a layer of zero or number one chromic cut gut with a continuous stitch to approximate the deeper halves of the incision. The outer depth of the myometrium is then closed with similar suture and with the running stitch or figure of eight sutures. No unnecessary needle tract should be made lest myometrial vessels be perforated leading to subsequent hemorrhage or hematomas. To achieve good approximation and to prevent the suture from tearing through the myometrium, it is helpful to have an assistant compress the uterus on each side toward the midline as each stitch is placed. So, in summary, we've talked about the indications of cesarean delivery, the techniques we used in terms of the abdominal incision, the hysterotomy incision, for the placental delivery, the uterine repair, and the abdominal closure. That's it for my lecture. Thank you for watching this video and please don't forget to subscribe in my YouTube channel and my WordPress site.